Welcome to Just Want a Quilt, a research podcast coming out of Tulane University Law School, where we explore all kinds of things, stories about quilting, tools, field trips, maybe some famous quilters stop by, and of course, a little bit of copyright thrown in just for fun. I'm Elizabeth Townsend Gard, your host. I'm a law professor at Tulane University Law School. I also hold two fellowships right now, one at the Business School and one at the Newcomb um, Institute at Tulane. And I just want a quilt. So how's the how's the mask the mask making going? Oh, uh, lots of masks being made. Um, I have a new strategy, so I'm excited to start. But um, I'm working with um, Judy Walker, who is our our neighbor, and actually, uh, yeah, who is a mutual friend. Um, and so I'm I'm kind of at Judy's beck and call. I often am. So she just tells me what I'm supposed to do next, and I do it. So she drops off stuff, and I cut stuff, and I sew certain things, and then she takes it all back, and <laughs> it's very funny. Oh wow! Yeah, she's got a so whole you guys network have an assembly line? of you know of people working on <laughs> like doing things, and you know she's very organized. So that's great. Yeah. So are you guys are you guys giving these to local? I saw. Um... Yeah. So it's not necessarily medical workers, right? You guys are uh, no, we're them... really focused on the secondary market, um, which is I think um, okay. The, uh, there's like 150 photographers and newspaper people who wanted them, so mm. she's doing that. And then we also just put in it for a grant um, to try to help um, certain areas of the city. So we'll see. But we really, I think there are lots of people working for the medical masks, but like people working. Um, in areas where that are coming in contact with people, we're trying to help them. Um, and it's all, we just give them to them. There's no paying or anything like that. Uh-huh. That's great. Yeah. It's a very, and very, the, the very good program. The getting a lot of action and the Facebook group, which we just started because we had to keep, you know, it's aspirational. It's a million masks a day, but it helped us sort of think about mm-hmm. like, don't make three, make 30, right? Uh, and yeah. uh, so that's been really cool. So, yeah, we're, and we're interviewing people every day um, who are on the front lines doing various things, from an ICU nurse to a, we just, I just finished, that's why I was late, a um, manufacturer of, um, a mattress manufacturer that has now um, uh, using spare, made a pattern and is using the local sewists in his area to make masks. They made 3,000 masks in like 10 days. Wow. I know, it's crazy, right? Huh. Anyway, anyway, that's great. Well, I mean, yeah. it's, it reminds it reminds me after uh, the storm in what in 2017, in the the flooding in Baton Rouge and like the Girl Scout troop that Caitlin was in, they made like hundreds of pillow cases. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, people people want to do something, they want to help out, and especially with everybody being at home, it's it's nice to have a project for yeah, sure. Yeah, and it's and I think what's so interesting about it is like you know we make quilts, quilters make quilts and charity quilts and sometimes you think like well do they really want it you know like (laughs) um Mm -hmm. but here it's like yeah people want them and are asking and you know when they find out you're making masks they're like can can we make can how do we help or we need them so it's um it's really remarkable it's terrible on every level terrible right like we shouldn't be making masks we shouldn't have a shortage we shouldn't have the coronavirus we shouldn't have any of this happening but the, the level of community that's coming together is pretty remarkable. It is. I was just talking with someone um, in Los Angeles today, the County of Los Angeles, their director of sustainability. And he said that, you know, on the plus side, this is kind of helping uh, um, reinforce the need for resilience, community and societal resilience, that people are checking in on their neighbors and they're, um, you know, bringing them food or doing what's necessary. And that's mm-hmm. really important um, that shows the resilience of the community. And we've obviously got it here in New Orleans yeah. from the ground up. Yeah. So 
It's really the remarkable. There's, there's it's All right, Los so Angeles, we, too, is cool. Uh, we've been recording, which I would like to keep what we've been recording, but let's officially begin, which is we always start with, tell me, I know this answer, but tell me your name and where you're calling from, which is like across the street. <laughs> you're okay. I'm calling from across uh, my the street. Name is, <laughs> yes, it's that. Uh, uh, my name is Pam Radke Russell, and I am calling uh, from across the street. You are. Elizabeth, we're, yeah. we're neighbors uh, yeah. in New Orleans. Exactly. And, um, yep. And we could have... just, I could have just come down and done this from the balcony. I could have just hollered up at you. Yeah, it would have been very Romeo and Juliet, and it would be weird, and the sound <laughs> would suck, you know. Right, right. Yeah, I told Sid um, that, because she hasn't seen any, like, we're really, really, really scared, so we're not doing anything. We're not going outside or anything. Um, we don't go outside very much anyway, so it's not really a huge change in our lifestyle. But um, uh, I was like, well, you could have your friend downstairs, and you can be on the balcony, and <laughs> You can like shout. Uh, she wasn't too keen on that one, so. <laughs> no, not so much. I can I can understand that. Yeah, she thought that yeah. was ridiculous. Um, okay, <laughs> so um, one more question before we get into why I asked you here: um, Do you have any memory of anyone sewing or quilting in your life? Yes, memories uh, sewing or cooking all Qu- the time. Uh, quilting, My mother quilting. Yeah, quilting. Quilting. Oh, quilting. Sewing or quilting. Oh, sewing or quilting. Um, well, my my uh, mother and my, uh, what is she? My husband's grandmother uh, was a big quilter. And so she did some quilting before she passed in 2001 that I was around for. Um, and she has, we have three or four quilts that she and her mother made for us. Um, or not that they've made. And so there are these beautiful quilts that um, we've had for a long time. And that's, that's really how quilting has been in my life. It's been, um, they're beautiful quilts. And of course, they're quilts that we we have up and we don't use because we're afraid they're going to get ruined. But um, it's a really special, they're very special to us. There's, there are three quilts that, um, that we have from her. And they've got pieces of fabric from like the kids, like her children's clothes. So Richard's dad's clothes and, you know, things like that. Very sweet. That's very sweet. Now tell me, I had seen, so first of all, the, the biggest thing is I think, uh, you introduced me, you, you suggested that Judy and I become friends, (laughs) which kind of changed my whole life (laughs) in like a really crazy way. Oh, that's awesome. Yes. Yeah. First, she taught me how to do, like, uh, not be shy and interview people when we went to a market the first time because I had never, like, just gone up to people and asked them questions. Um, and second, she's uh-huh. always got some scheme going of what we're doing or what we're – she's just so involved in the community and, like, I don't know, you feel like you're in the, the flurry of Judy um, in the most remarkable ways. So she's really been a huge influence on not just me but our family so I appreciate the connection it's really did change my whole world in this crazy way that's awesome yeah that's a, I mean that's and that's kind of I think uh one of the things you wanted to talk about was my women's group and that's kind of like I feel like I'm really good at connecting people and like knowing in the back of my head yeah, who likes what who does what you're totally a good and, matchmaker um, it's amazing it's really yeah. interesting yeah. so yeah let's talk about that what I wanted to talk to you about both was like the women's group that you started and also kind of you were saying how busy you were and so I wanted to talk a little bit about sort of what you do and what's what's going on in your world um at work um to help understand sort of how this is impacting on a variety of people oh sure sure so um i work um for an engineering and uh, construction business magazine called engineering news record we've been around for since 18 something so um we have a staff of 20 plus throughout the nation and we typically cover things like you know, buildings going up or, um, you know, like the Mississippi river river diversion project or, you know, typical construction engineering policy, uh, uh, you know, about engineering and construction. My focus has been on energy and environment for years. Um, and we are, we're a weekly magazine. So we had been focused for a long time just on producing a weekly magazine. Um, and actually starting in January, we focused, I started kind of pushing people to start writing more for the daily digital, you know, we have a website, it's yeah, engineering news record, ENR.com. And so um, 
we started producing more content for the daily magazine. And fortunately that came before COVID hit us. And when COVID hit us, um, we had, um, we had a, uh, you know, just so much was happening. There was a, a lot of um, interest in stories about cities that were shutting down construction um, or, or, you know, shutting down and kind of, kind of how that impacted construction. And we've gone from um, maybe writing two stories a day to writing like six stories a day. We've had uh, over two weeks, we had like 70 stories. And this is from a staff of, of 70 who are also, who is also doing other things uh, at the same time. Um, and it's, it's a great example of how when news happens, true journalists kind of jump on it and just kind of go with it and, uh, you know, to hell with our, <laughs> with the rest of what's going on. Um, and in that sense, it's, it's reminiscent of Katrina uh, when I was at the time sticking with Judy and, um, was she there in 2000? Yeah, she was, wasn't she? Yeah, yeah she was, she of was course. There for and um, yeah, and so, you know, how you just kind of put everything aside and you start, you know, providing information for the people who, who need it. And so, you know, we're a little more specific in that we're providing more business content than, you know, the actual COVID counts, but um, it's important to our audience. So yeah. uh, we've been, we've gone from working kind of, you know, eight hours a day to, to working, I not, I don't know, for the last, I, for about two weeks, I was working in, um, not constantly, but working from about eight, seven in the morning till about nine thirty, ten 10 o'clock at night. Yeah. And a lot of that was working solid. Um, and so the days kind of are flying by. Um, and yeah, so I'm keeping, I'm keeping busy, <laughs> which is, a, which is a good thing. Yeah, it is a good yeah. thing. Yeah. And so what, um, in terms of construction and engineering, what are you seeing? And um, that was a call, that was one of the questions that came up at Tulane of whether they were continuing their construction projects, but sort of how is that industry being impacted by this? Sure. Well, so um, it, it varies. There are, you know, in New Orleans here, construction is continuing, um, but for example, the Four Seasons Hotel that's going up on the riverfront, the, um, the old World Trade Center, they, their, their staff has gone down. They had about 100, 450 people on site. And because of the fears of coronavirus or people actually having coronavirus, um, they're down to 100 and some. And that may have, that was last week, so that may be even less now. Um, one of the cool things is that they have technologies that, that, you know, on a risk and safety perspective, they have technologies that can track where you are on the site. And so people are, are using that, that not everybody uses that, but the people that have that kind of system are able to track where a certain person who had, who has COVID came into contact with other people. So that's kind of a neat technology that's being used. Yeah. Um, but, but so, but in like places like, so Boston was the first to completely shut down their construction program. Um, and, and now Los Angeles uh, is saying, uh, Mayor Garcetti said yesterday that, you know, report if you see construction going on, which was kind of like, what? <laughs> so all these people are going to be calling in saying, and in fact, there's a reward for it. It's like all these people are going to be coming in really? saying, uh, oh, there's, you know, construction going on. So um, there's really a, a struggle right now to find, you know, to figure out what should, what kind of construction is essential and what kind of construction is not essential. Um, and there's huge masses of confusion over that. Um, you know, unfortunately, in most construction sites, if you're working in the interior of a building, you can't stay six, it's, it's hard to stay six feet apart from somebody. But on the flip side, a lot of the times they already have PPE on. Right. So they might already have an N95 mask on, so they might be safe. But um, the other side of it is some of these big projects. There was a, a project I went up to in Manitoba that's a, a work camp. They're building a hydroelectric dam. They had to shut down because they're, they're in cramped quarters with everybody. So, oh, you know, or if you're staying you know, if you're if you're traveling, a lot of the workers, trade workers, union workers, are in short supply. So they often travel to these big work sites and um, and they stay in hotels with each other. Right. So, right. you know, so that seems right for problems. Yeah. And is there a problem because of the yeah. mask shortage as well? Um, you know, we at first. Uh, we thought there might be, but the construction companies are, a lot of them are coming forward and, do and donating their masks because their work is slowing down and because they realize the shortage. So it's, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think 
Mike Pence, Vice President Pence said a couple of weeks ago, you know, construction com- companies need to volunteer and give uh, give up their PPE, mm-hmm. to which the contractors were like, whoa, wait a minute, don't take away our stuff. And now, now what you're seeing is instead of that knee jerk reaction, people, you know, voluntarily going through their stocks and, and, and giving up their masks and other uh, PPE that can be used. That's remarkable. So what, so, um, so what, how, how is this going to impact on your industry? I mean, we're worried about so many different industries. Will it, you know, is there fear or sort of what's happening in your, in your world? Well, there's, um, they, the, the overall, it doesn't look good for anybody, right? Um, but the, econ- the economists from Moody's and S&P are saying that construction is less likely to be impacted than some other industries because there's still a need to build certain things. I mean, you're, you're always going to have to do that road work. You're always going to have to build schools, you know, and, and like right now, uh, hospitals will be a big push, obviously. Um, and that's already occurring. People are trying to expedite um, ongoing hospital projects. So um, it'll shift for sure. And I'm sure like every place else, there'll probably be a slowdown. Um, but you know, the economists at this point are saying that the construction might be better off, fare better than other industries. Very interesting. So interesting. Oh, it's so chaotic, isn't it? It's just so crazy. Yeah, I know. It really is. Um, yeah. Well, let's shift gears and talk about your um, group. Uh, tell me again, I'm in the group, but tell me the name of the group, the Facebook group. Sure. It's Hot Women of an Uncertain Age. <laughs> Um, okay, so, so tell me, it's a, yeah. and is it? It's not open, is it? So people are listening. They're like, I want to join that. Can you join this group, or is it closed now? It's closed now, but we can. I've been meaning to to set up a page, and maybe this will, um, you know, encourage me to do so, like a, a page that people could sign up, and we could we could establish other groups. Cool. So what we did, what I did was, um, in in some of my recent travels, I visited some friends on both coasts. And talk to them and um, it just seemed like there's such a desire to talk about things that we typically don't talk about Um, you know menopause and uh, parenting and taking care of our parents Um, and people are you know they just don't you know we're in the middle of our lives and we're doing all this stuff so why would we talk about it we just need to get all this stuff done Um, and also, the, I've been doing a lot of reading, and, and it turns out, it seems that Generation X, our generation, um, was the first that was raised almost with the expectation that, yes, you can have a family, and you can have a career, and you should do both. Right. Exactly. Um, have it all. So, right. Do it all. Have it all. Have and it all. Was, right. right. Which is such and not just that, but like and, the expectation that we were going to succeed as much as we possibly could, you know, like this aggressive kind of mm-hmm. like, you know. I don't know. At least in my family, it was like, there was a lot. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I'm the same way. And I, I like jumped into my career and, and never looked back. And, you know, at some point you're like, wait a minute, right. <laughs> you know, the wrong turns that you took or just trying to succeed and then leaving other things behind. And, um, but we didn't, you know, it wasn't like it is now like, okay, you have to have a balance. It was like just full steam ahead. And, and I make this reference and actually the, the book, um, uh, why we can't sleep. I think it's Ada Calhoun. She makes a lot of the same points that I was making before too. Is that, you know, that, that Anjali commercial, like you can bring home the bacon, fry it right. up in the pan, and never right. let you know you right. forget you're a man. Right. And I like I like embraced that. I'm like, right. oh yeah. And right. I was like 12, right? right. Exactly. <laughs> we were the age that, that commercial was on. It was like we can be everything, right? Right. Yeah. Like, oh, I'm gonna be sexy. I'm gonna come home in my suit, and then. You know, I didn't know what sex was at that time, but, oh, it was going to be great. Yeah. (laughs) So so anyway, so I, you know, I opened up this group and and started, like, I invited all of my friends, which was like 100, actually, there are more that didn't join, but like 150, and then they invited their friends. Right. So we've got about 300 women on the board, and we capped it because we wanted to create intimacy and comfortableness with everybody. Um. So people could feel free to talk and know that it wasn't going to go anyplace else. Yeah. Um, and at the same, so that's generally for people, 40 to women, 40 to 60. At the same time, I have a good friend, um, Emily Holden, who's um, who lives in Washington, D.C., but she's actually from Baton Rouge. 
she was like, well, my, you know, women my age need this group too. And she, so she started a group for women generally in their thirties. And that's just called an uncertain age. That group's just now called an uncertain age because she was concerned. She's got a couple of, um, uh, non cisgendered people in her group yeah. and um there's been con- some some concerns like she has concerns about the way uh trans people are treated and so she wanted to be completely inclusive that's great so um yeah so she's got that group going and she's got 250 members in it um so it's you know i, I think of it as my you know the the um Right. Sister made, site. Right. You made uh, a group. You made a bit. It's like a, we did that a couple, like, like at least once where a, there's a spin off group. <laughs> You're like, oh, that's so cute. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, um, and it's, it's really interesting to be, I'm, I'm on both groups and I don't participate in her group, but I do observe. And it's, it's a completely different dynamic in her group than it is in our group. Yeah. Um, the younger women, younger women are, are like, they have a bigger perspective. Their worldview is much bigger. Yeah. They, you know, just starting out before COVID happened, she's like, what's your concern? And they were all like that this world is going to hell, basically. You know, and when I was in my 30s, my early 30s or 20s, I didn't think about that. I was concerned about my career. I was concerned yeah. about my family, you know. So it's, it's crazy, really, yeah, that's to, to really see crazy. the differences in the group. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I think the group is really fun and interesting and uh, gets a little bit um, wild and lovely and it's just really cool. It's a great group. Um, yeah. What, what do you think the key before COVID, before like everybody was talking, what were the key issues you saw in the group, like the top three? Um, so I think uh, menopause really was a big concern um, because we don't talk about menopause. And so no one knew, like, we don't know, like, generally, it was like, you're a menopausal woman, what... Um, what, what do you expect? Right. right. Uh, no, you know, no one knows what to expect. And so this is kind of like, we did a, a survey at the very beginning, like what are your top symptoms? And that seemed to be really enlightening for a lot of people. Yeah. Um, and people are like, well, when, when does menopause even start? You right. know, when, you know, what happens if I'm missing my period? Um, you know, uh, do I get, you know, I'm worried about hot flashes. What, what should I do? What kind of hormonal treatments are people and everybody is it's such a large scale yeah a large range of of menopausal conditions and symptoms that I think is really um really interesting like like the majority of women don't necessarily have hot flashes that need treatment um they you know they can manage them on their own um but like so there's that that's the biggest issue the second issue I would say is the the um uh what's the work the workload the invisible workload yeah. of women is a big one too right. um just yeah just like trying to just you know and it, it's really nice because like i'll tell my husband about the group or a man and they're like oh you're just bitching about men i'm like no we're actually not yeah. <laughs> we're, we're trying to figure out how we got in this position in the first place right. and you know how can we manage it um and so there's that and then i think um I don't know. The other issue I would say is just feelings, you know, anxiety, depression, um, being able to be open and honest with each other. That's not really a specific issue, but I think there's a lot of appreciation for that, that to have a place on Facebook that's not fake. Uh, in fact, somebody posted, you know, post COVID that that's, you know, oh, I see all these families on here, you know, doing these great family things. Right. And this is miserable and I'm miserable and this is the only place I can voice that. Right. So right. um it's yeah. it's a great place for that. Yeah. Well I just think it's great. Um it's so weird that you're across the street, I have to say. Um this is um <laughs> this is good. Well, you know, um and then how is your family doing and how you have two teenage girls and your husband, how are you all coping? We're good there. Um, you know, the, the kids, as you probably know, know how to social distance already from us. Yes. So, you know, we yes, don't really see true. them. We making, making the, making, uh, you know, banana nut bread and bacon to lure them out of the, out of the rooms. Um, so I think to some extent they don't mind this too much, but they do miss their friends, um, for sure. And, and, Caitlin, my 16-year-old, like last week, she was like, I just want to go for a walk. I'm like, 
you know, and I'm like, she goes, I just want to get away from the house and go for a walk. I'm like, oh, let's all go for a ha- walk. And she's like, no, mom, I want. <laughs> no, no, misunderstood. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Now, um, have yours gone then, to um, spending a lot of time in the evenings or late late evenings online? Like, is that happening in your house? I think they're online all the time. Yeah, yeah. mine too. Because they're actually, I don't know about Sydney, but I know that the, the girls have a lot of online work. And yeah, um, mine does it's too. getting stretched out. So like literally from eight o'clock in the morning till like five o'clock at night, they are on their computers working, working. And then when they're yeah, off, and, and they're like, they eat a little bit and they're back on with their friends. Yes. Yeah. 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 Kind of, kind of that or watching Instagram or, you know, doing whatever, not watching Instagram, but you know, YouTube or. Yeah. Just like, we, but yeah, it's really interesting. Um, yeah, Gen, yeah. Gen Z knows how to self, self quarantine. <laughs> Right. Yes. Yeah. So, very interesting. <laughs> yes. Um, huh, so insane. Um, well, I really appreciate you chatting super much. Um, I think it's great. Um, and it's nice to get a variety of perspectives of what's happening right now. Um, and I feel like yeah. you, um, you know, you say like you're really like just want to quilt has become a thing. And it's because in great part because of you. So I feel like you're part of our, our little world, even though you're not a quilter or whatever, because you... So we're instrumental in connecting me and Judy, and it all kind of. Well, started I'm so from happy there. to. Um, yeah, I'm I'm happy to hear that. That's great. Yeah, great. Um, and well, I so, have to tell you, the Girl Scout cookies fiasco. So you, we sold Girl Scout cookies, and I had to pay for it. And they went on and on and on. I keep finding fifty four dollars. We bought a lot of cookies for people listening. So fifty four dollars, like little packs of money that I got. Over the year, as I'm cleaning, I found another one. So I've, I had I had the, the idea to pay you many times. It just was very hard to get across the street to give you that pack. So, That's yes, so I funny. keep finding $54, little envelopes all over the house. So, Well, don't uh, don't worry um, about it. I, I wasn't worried. I wasn't ever worried about it because you're right across. I knew where you exactly. lived. Exactly. Right? Well, like we so. got you money finally, but it made me laugh because I'm like, yeah. when am I going to stop finding packets of fifty four dollars to pay for the cookies that we've already paid for? Um, so it's getting, right. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Anyway, well, um, I do adore you, and um, I hope you and your family stay safe. And you're cool with us posting this. This is okay. Yeah, this okay. is great. Awesome. Okay, hold on just a sec. All right. So you've been listening to Just Want a Quilt, a research podcast coming out of Tulane University Law School. And I'm Elizabeth Townsend Gard. If you like this podcast, keep listening. Also, we have a Facebook group. Come join us. We talk about a lot of things. We also have an Instagram account. And of course, most importantly, I really hope you get a chance to quilt today.